So now I'd like to introduce everyone to today's fantastic speakers. This afternoon, we'll be hearing some from some researchers whose work focuses on a wide range of topics, from human mobility tracking to predicting COVID immune responses and possible de decontamination processes. Um, first, I'd like to invite Professor Abunaiki of the University of Delaware to kick us off. So I will stop sharing my screen. And Professor, if you'd like to um, get started, you're, you're up. Let me share my screen. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the work that we are doing uh, with the Nemours Children's Hospital on predictive modeling and optimal control uh, framework for model-based epidemic response in Delaware. Uh, by definition of a lightning talk, things will go by very quickly. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at the end. Our objective is to develop and evaluate a predictive modeling approach that can be applied to the spread of SARS-CoV-2, but able to adapt it to emergent infectious diseases later on, especially for children. Uh, we're focusing on the state of Delaware right now, and we'll talk a little bit about the optimal uh, model-based mitigation strategy toward the end. I don't need to tell this audience about mathematical modeling and how it has become a standard tool in the arsenal of practitioners. And there have been various approaches to COVID-19 modeling, which we don't have time to go through, but I will then motivate why we're taking the approach that we're taking. Uh, we're using the concept of chemical reaction kinetics. When uh, a species comes in contact with another species, they react. Uh, but by using this framework, it allows us to do several things that we may not be able to do uh, otherwise. Uh, so for example, we have this concept of residence time distribution, which helps us characterize how much time a molecule spends inside of a reactor, which is somewhat similar to the time it takes for a person who's been infected to recover or to die. So it's those kinds of things that we uh, use. This is probably the, the most important slide at this point uh, to give you an idea of the mechanism. So uh, if A in red represents someone who's infected, comes in contact with someone who is not infected, you get two infected people. At the rate of transmission is case of T. And then that person can recover, but goes through an intermediate stage where you're still infectious, and then you become completely recovered. Same thing, unfortunately, for death, intermediate stage where you can still infect people and so on and so forth. The secondary transmission is somebody who's on the way to recovery or someone on the way to death can still infect other people. And then if you imagine that everybody who's been infected and who's on the way to getting well or on the way to dying is in some uh, reactor, they take some time before they escape to recovery completely or to death completely. By doing it this way, we can characterize this with a set of uh, state equations that chemical engineers will, will recognize. And, uh, but the most important thing from this framework is we recognize that not every person that has been infected has been identified as such. So when we take a measure measurement we take is only a fraction of the people that have actually been infected. Uh, and so by incorporating this into this model, it allows us to be able to develop a model. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but uh, from the model, how do we determine the parameters? We take data, uh, training data, and we use least squares optimization to obtain these parameters, this, this rate constants, and we reserve the most recent week of data for validation. In other words, if we had three weeks of data, we use the first two weeks of data to fit the models, and then we try to predict what would have happened the third week as if we didn't have that and use that to do validation. And then we repeat this every week, moving the origin of the validation data for a moving horizon uh, uh, situation. So here is what happened uh, for us at May, May 23rd. The blue line, uh, the solid blue line 
is the seven day moving average. The data with a lot of noise, obviously, these are daily recorded cases is, is all over the place. Our model prediction at the time is this classic uh, curve that, that, that people are familiar with. And so this is what we were thinking of on May 23rd and we were really feeling good that maybe things would uh, uh, be, be uh, finishing by, by the end of July. This is the cumulative data. Uh, you can see what we used to fit and what we used to, to uh, uh, validate. Uh, this is the percent of uninfected people. These are the results that we obtained at that time and the prediction of the final population of in, uninfected and so on and so forth. The most important result at the time was that we estimated a total infected uh, percent infected that was unidentified as 30%. And actually that has been since, it was since confirmed that uh, only about that much at that time was, was, uh, uh, in, uh, was identified as infected, which meant that 70% were asymptomatic or presymptomatic or symptomatic but untested. And, and all of that started to argue strongly for random sampling to be able to detect the asymptomatic and then do something about it. Uh, let me just jump real quickly to what happened in September 27. And as you can see, we did some pretty stupid things in the sense that we didn't pay attention and we had a second wave when we had a third wave and our model was able to adapt and keep up. And uh, since then, uh, we've actually had a, a, a fourth wave, and, and I'm just going to show you how our model was uh, keeping up. Again, keep your mind, uh, keep your eye on the, uh, the, the curve itself. The solid blue line is the seven-day moving average, and so we've been tracking it fairly well and all of the things that are going on. And uh, it's, it's probably important to show you some estimates of the rate of transmission. And so this is what's happened over the last nine weeks by the last time that we, we checked, you can see that the rate of transmission was starting to go down and it's starting to ick back up again. And so I, I hope we don't have some really serious issues again. Now, the, the part that you may not have seen before is the fact that we can actually do active intervention. When we do random sampling and contact tracing and we find people that are infected, we quarantine and we treat them. This is the mathematical equivalent of introducing this function u of t, which unfortunately I don't have the time to explain to you how we obtain this. But if you give me a fraction of infected, a start date for, the, for going out to sample people and, and the sampling period and the total population and the fraction of the population, we can determine uh, what to do to uh, meet some objective that you can say. Let me just show you some results. That's the equation you will see. So for example, if at the very beginning in the state of Delaware, at the very beginning, 30 days after, if we had sampled every week and we took a 0.02% of the population of the state of Delaware, that is the number of people that we sample and we test, and for an initial uh, fraction of infected people of 0.01, here is what we would have seen. We could have shortened, this is not flattening the curve. This is changing the curve completely. We would have brought things back by about 15 days and about a 50% reduction if we had done this uh, 30 days. Now, why are we doing this now? We're saying the next time something happens, <laughs> we will know what to do, how to do it, and things of that look like. The red curve is what we would have seen instead of the blue curve. We would have uh, handled things. Now, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there are many, many parameters that we can select. So there are different ways of achieving the same objective. And so as is typical, you'd show a contour curve. So for example, if we wanted to bring the, uh, the, the uh, COVID infection down to uh, a, a less detectable value in 100 days, we can achieve that by doing a sample size of, of 0.15, sampling seven uh, every week. And, and uh, so anyway, these, these are some of the results that we've obtained. I'm going to skip this because it's really not. This is what just to show us that if you don't start early, it becomes more difficult to be able to get things done. So let me summarize and conclude. We've used a chemical engineering reaction kinetics-based model for COVID-19 spread. 
We've applied it to the state of Delaware, but we haven't shown you the other data sets that we've applied it to. Uh, we've used the model to study the effect of active in intervention. We're now developing a recursive approach uh, for children and that we're gonna develop a, a, a platform that uh, decision makers can use. I'd like to acknowledge my postdoc, Yu Luo, who now has a real job with GlaxoSmithKline. And we have two grad students working with uh, Rob Akins and with me, Neha and Jonathan, and Julie Cart is the computer scientist working with us. That's it. Thank you very much.